What a time to be alive. What a time to be a human being, particularly living in the United States of America. It's always been a great time to be a human being living in the United States of America. Always. Well, maybe that's not necessarily true. There have been times it's not been great to be a human being living in the United States of America. If you were a certain kind of person living in the United States of America, you get the idea. Today, though, today, living in the United States of America, it's a pretty good time. Compared to what? Well, compared to the majority of human history, I suppose. Is it great? Is it perfect? No, nothing is perfect. But it's always wise to not let perfect be the enemy of good. Keep things in perspective. That's really, really, really hard to do because that's we're just not. I don't think that we're designed as human beings to to keep things in perspective, to be able to take a a long term view on things. We oftentimes have a hard time seeing past the bridge of our nose and seeing anything past what is directly affecting us at that very specific moment in time. But <clears throat> I just want to reinforce. But a great place we're living in, and more importantly, that we need to be fighting for and advocating for the freedoms that we have and figuring out how to work together. Because like your parents, if they divorced, you recognize and know what a disaster that is, having to do holidays at two different households. Now, of course, if your parents were having a terribly abusive relationship and <clears throat> there was bad stuff going on, then that's one thing. But if it's just irreconcilable differences, like your folks just didn't want to get along anymore, so they got divorced, you recognize that um, probably would have been better if mom and dad could have just figured out how to get along than to not. And we recognize that relationships <clears throat> are really, really difficult. And certainly not easy and no different than our relationship right now with, uh, with two sides of the country, for lack of a better term, let's call them progressive and conservative. There's actually talk about national divorce and stuff like that. And that's just not, I don't think that, I do think that we should do everything within our power to try and head that off to figure out how to make this thing work instead of just tearing it all down. Because I can't imagine we're going to replace it with anything that's better. Anyway, a couple of weeks ago, a week or so ago, I did a deep dive into, into our ability as United States citizens to burn the, to burn the American flag. And it is. It was a conversation really about the First Amendment, so our freedom of speech. <clears throat> and I wanted to continue on that and talk about, think about, and have you think about hate speech. This is another one of those issues that has been top of mind, on the tip of our tongue as of late. And we've got new words out like microaggressions and deplatforming and protected speech and hate speech. These are not new, new terms. Deplatforming, aggressions, microaggressions, these absolutely are. <clears throat> and I remember hearing about microaggressions for the first time and thinking, well, how dumb is that? Like life is full of microaggressions. <laughs> I, I microaggress against myself all the time and you know, just because somebody microaggresses against me doesn't mean that I need to uh, to turn the world upside down um, and to get retribution against that person. That's just part of living with other human beings in a society is we're going to do things that rub each other the wrong way. Um, so microaggressions made me think about that whole old term. Sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt. And that's true, and it's not true, because words certainly do hurt. You can say really mean things to people, and you will 100% hurt their feelings. 
you will give them a potential complex that will stick with them forever. You probably remember some of the worst things that were ever said to you, and it stays with you today. Now, all these things being true, because multiple things can be true at the same time, that doesn't mean that we should stop people from saying it. The antidote to bad ideas is not stopping somebody from, stopping somebody from saying them. The antidote to bad ideas is better ideas or good ideas. And I would far rather know what is in the heart and the mind of people than to not. I would rather have somebody get on stage and tell me about how much they hate me or hate another group or another team or whatever. I'd rather know where they stand versus them, you know, lurking around in the shadows and and planning and making plans without me knowing about it until shit gets too out of hand or it's too late. I would rather know where everybody stands as much as I can. Doesn't that make more sense? And ideally, then I would like to be able to challenge that person to find out why it is that they think the way that they think. Like, where did these opinions come from? You know, how did you develop them? Have you developed them? Or are you just saying them? And then I'd like to bring you around to my way of thinking or to give you some different ideas to chew on and think about. I think that that is a, a healthier way to go about living together because that's what I want. I want all of us to really coexist, not to just lead parallel lives because that's where this is all sort of going is parallel economies and parallel communities and neighborhoods and everything else where it's just all sort of sectioned off. You know that Germany used to do that. I don't know if you know that or not. I wonder. The Berlin Wall separated <clears throat> um, Germany. So if you're curious about that, that was tried. Didn't work. Took the wall down. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's interesting. I imagine that that's a net positive. But that's not where we want to get to. I don't think. That's not what I want. That is not where I want to get to. So I guess I can only speak for myself. How about you? What do you think? What do you think about this idea of, of hate speech and deplatforming and it's an aggression against me if I am, if somebody comes to my college campus or my city and is able to deliver a talk, is that violence against me or words actually violence? Now, I, I am curious as to how many people actually think that. How many people actually think the words are violence? Maybe it's a lot of people. Maybe it's very few. And it's just one of these made up sort of nonsense thing that gets floated around and people sort of continue talking about. I don't know. But I certainly do not think that, that words are violence. Now, what is hate speech? What is hate speech? It's any form of communication, whether spoken, written, or behavioral, that belittles or discriminates against individuals or groups based on attributes such as race, religion, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, or gender. It often incites violence or prejudicial action against these groups or individuals are intended to intimidate or oppress them. So there you go. That is a definition of hate speech. What about protected speech? Many countries, especially those with strong free speech protections like ours, most, 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 most speech is protected under the law. This includes the right to express opinions, ideas, and criticisms, even if they are unpopular or controversial. However, it's not protection. This protection is not absolute and does not cover certain types of speech, like an incitement to violence. So if you are saying things that are intended and likely to incite imminent lawless action that crosses the boundary and is no longer protected, truth threats. Statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of intent to commit an act of unlawful violence is not protected. Obscenity. 
speech that is considered offensive, particularly with sexual content and lacks serious literary, artistic, p- political, or scientific value is not protected. Defamation. These are false statements that damage someone else's reputation. Not protected. <clears throat> um, it's important to understand and differentiate between impact and intent. Hate speech often aims to demean or harm individuals or groups based on specific characteristics that lead to the discrimination or violence. Protected speech can include offensive or disagreeable ideas, but does not necessarily incite violence or discrimination. There's legal boundaries. Laws in various countries set boundaries for what constitutes hate speech, often including criteria like incitement to violence, threats, and severe harassment. Protected speech is generally broader, but excludes actions that fall into these legally defined categories. And context is also really important. The context in which the speech occurs is a factor. Um, A statement made in a political debate might be protected, while the same statement made with the intent to incite violence or hatred might not be. Talked about last time why it's really important to have highly qualified justices on the Supreme Court and highly qualified justices at every level of our judiciary system because there's so much nuance and so much interpretation that goes into each individual scenario or situation that you want somebody who is wise enough to take past judicial decisions as well as the laws and interpret current events based on through the lens of those past decisions and laws. And there's so much nuance and does demand a degree of wisdom versus simple interpretations. So, so important. Speaking of the United States Supreme Court, wanted to talk about some of the decisions that have shaped our understanding and the limits of hate speech and protected speech. 1969, Brandenburg versus Ohio, the Supreme Court ruled that speech advocating for illegal conduct is protected under the First Amendment unless it's likely to incite imminent lawless action. It involved a Ku Klux Klan leader who made a speech at a rally. And what happened was the impact was the establishment of imminent lawless action test, which is a high bar for restricting speech. So that's where that came from, imminent lawless action. So did did what this person say cause or lead to lawless action, imminent lawless action? So it's a high bar because we want, as a society, decided a long time ago that it was important to protect speech, to allow speech versus limit it. 1992, RAV versus the city of St. Paul. The court struck down a city ordinance that prohibited the display of symbols such as a swastika or a burning cross that could arouse anger, alarm, or resentment in others based on race, color, creed, religion, or gender. The impact was the it emphasized that the government cannot prohibit speech based on its content, even if the speech is hateful, unless it falls into a category of unprotected speech like threats, or incitement. So they were saying that somebody can display a swastika, somebody can display a burning cross so long as it is not threatening or causing um, imminent violence. It's not inciting violence. 2003, Virginia versus Black, the court held that a state law banning cross burning with the intent to intimidate was constitutional. The ruling distinguished between cross burning as a form of expression and cross burning intended as a threat. So in this example, the court held that a law was that a law that banned cross burning with the intent of intimidation, that is constitutional. So that's a fine law. This decision clarified that true threats and intimidations are not protected by the First Amendment, but expressions of ideas are protected. So there's clarification. If what you are doing is a threat of intimidation, is a threat and intimidation, it's not protected speech. Okay. 
2011, Snyder versus Phelps. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Westboro Baptist Church. Those lovely human beings, yikes, which had picketed a soldier's funeral with offensive signs. They make the most offensive signs. Um, like it's crazy how, just if you're not familiar with the Westboro Baptist Church, they are, they are a crazy organization. <clears throat> Again, Supreme Court ruled in favor of them, which had picketed a soldier's funeral with offensive signs. The court held that their speech was protected under the First Amendment because it addressed matters of public concern. The impact was it reinforced that speech on public issues, even if it is deeply offensive, is protected by the First Amendment. So you and I can recognize <clears throat> how awful certain speech is. But... We also recognize that it is of greater societal value to allow people to say it than to restrict their ability to say it because we're offended by it. Okay, so that's the wisdom right there. We can all universally agree to hate something that doesn't make it hate speech. 2017, Mattal versus Tam, the court ruled that the government cannot refuse to register trademarks that might be considered disparaging. The case involved an Asian-American band called The Slants seeking to trademark their name. Okay, so government cannot refuse to register a trademark on an Asian-American band. The Slants said, we want to trademark the name of our band. Government said, no, you can't. Supreme Court said, no, you can. So... The impact was that the court affirmed that the government cannot restrict speech based on its viewpoint, emphasizing that even offensive speech is protected. So there you go. A musical band comprised of Asian Americans co-opted the, the racist term slants and went to the United States government to trademark it. Government said, no, you can't do that. It's offensive. Supreme Court said they absolutely can do that. It may be offensive, but it's still protected. So here are some of the key points when we're trying to understand protected speech versus non-protected hate speech, unprotected hate speech. There are content-based restrictions. Supreme Court generally disfavors laws that restrict speech based on its content. Even offensive speech is usually protected unless it falls into a narrowly defined category like truth threats, incitement or obscenity. They also, one of the key takeaways is that context matters. Context of the speech, like whether it addresses a matter of public concern can influence whether it's protected. There's a high bar for restricting speech. The threshold for restricting speech needs to be high, particularly for speech that addresses public issues or does not directly incite imminent legal activity. These cases demonstrate the strong protections for free speech in the United States, even when the speech is quest in question is deeply offensive or hateful. However, the court has also recognized that certain types of harmful, harmful speech, like truth threats or incitement to violence, are not protected. So anytime that you're thinking about these issues and you think, how can somebody be allowed to say that, take a step back and think back to some of these parameters or what the wisdom behind these decisions are is that we are placing our ability to communicate and say what's on our mind above somebody else's being offended. We place higher value on our freedom of speech and ability to say things and express ourselves and to protest we place a higher value on that than somebody being offended. Doesn't that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you? Maybe it doesn't. Another individual's ability to express themselves is supersedes your, your being offended by it. Okay. The last one on burning the flag talked about the famous Voltaire quote it says, I may not like what they have to say, but I will defend to their death, to the death, to my death, 
their right to say it. And that is a profound and important thing. So the next time you find yourself feeling like you're the victim of a microaggression and you want somebody to do something about it, I say toughen up a little bit. Not that big of a deal. It's probably something that you have to say, an opinion that you have that could be offensive to somebody else. Being offended is okay. It's not illegal. Too harsh? I don't think so. I don't think so. What somebody thinks about you is not any of your business. And what somebody says about you is also really not a lot of your business. Hmm. And if there's somebody saying something that you are so deeply offended by that you want to prevent them from saying it, I say to you, get your arguments in line. Read up on the issue. Figure out how to articulate why that person is incorrect, why their viewpoint is incorrect. And engage in a civil debate, a civil and robust debate conversation about the merits of your points and your ideas and see whose version survives its collision with 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 reality finally speech is not violence violence is violence and there's plenty of violence going on in the world right now and restricting our ability to talk about it and to point it out that is the greatest threat. And we're seeing that everywhere in the form of censorship and viewpoints and really censorship where if you're searching for information on something and you can't find it because some entity or organization or peer, per, peer people or persons decided that they didn't want you to know about it. That is, I think is a greater threat than the actual saying of whatever the words are. I don't need thought police or any kind of a nanny state telling me what I ought to be thinking about or, or anything like that. I can make up my own mind. I'm not fragile, fragile. Neither are you. You're strong enough. You're tough enough. You can handle the truth. Do you want the truth? As always, do your part by doing your best.